I'd like to welcome Aparna Srinivasan and uh, Dr. Angela Depremont, who will be moderating the, the um, Lunar Law and Tech Policy Panel, and then you'll, you'll introduce them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Thank all right. You, Thank you. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, welcome everyone to LSIC's inaugural panel dedicated to lunar law and tech policy issues. My name is Aparna Srinivasan. I'm an analyst here at the lab, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Angela Dapramont. She's a postdoc fellow here at the lab, and together we will be moderating this session. Okay. So, what is this? All right, there we go, okay. So what is this panel about? Okay, so as we know, NASA is rapidly moving forward towards its goals of establishing a sustainable long-term presence on the moon's surface, right? So we are here to talk about some of the legal and policy challenges and opportunities to foster scientific advances and economic growth in the lunar ecosystem. And so why is this important? Because this sustainability is achieved by leveraging the extensive natural resources of the moon, right? So for example, we know that the moon's surface is covered by layers, meters of granular regolith, right? This is a mixture of rocks and fine grained particles. And in fact, a fistful of this regolith is said to contain more than 40% oxygen, which if extracted could be used for life support systems and propellant. Right? Additionally, the byproducts of the extraction process, uh, the, the metals and the minerals are conducive for in-situ manufacturing and habitat construction. And furthermore, estimates indicate there are anywhere between 600 million metric tons to 1 billion metric tons of water ice to harvest, right? So if we extract oxygen and hydrogen, this is another great source of propellant. So we see here how important these resources are to creating sustainability. And this is why we need to think about how the laws and the policies apply, right? So we know that the technology drives exploration, but what is driving the technology? It's the certainty and the clarity of the laws that encourages investments in VC capital funding. It's the certainty and clarity of the laws that builds confidence in how we design and engineer our technology, right? Because at the end of the day, that is what we need to be able to, to, to go to the moon and to go to the places on the moon where there are key resources. So as we know, there are some key resources concentrated in certain areas, right? They're near the poles where there are optimal conditions such as sufficient uh, sunlight or proximity to a PLR or even a clear line of sight to earth for comms, right? And so this is where we need to be. And all of these raise questions. They raise questions of how to best manage competition for access to these strategic locations on the moon, how to deal with you know, imminent um, overcrowding or interference with activities, either their activities or interference with radio spectrum, right, between state parties and private actors, and how to govern and be governed. So here, to talk through these really important topics, right, for us to get to the moon and to, be, and to be sustainable in a lunar ecosystem. We have an extraordinary lineup of, of space lawyers and policy experts here with us today. I'm, gosh, I'm so honored to have them here with us. So joining us is Chris Johnson. He's a space law advisor for the Secure World Foundation and professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center. He is the perfect person to walk us through international space law treaties and domestic legislation. Also on the panel, um, well, uh, can we, can we see Timmy? We'll move on. I'll introduce Timmy if she's able to come on. Okay. So also on the panel, we have Jessie Kate Shingler. She's an, oh, there she is. Perfect. Timmy. Okay. Timmy Aganaba. She's a British, Canadian, Nigerian, outer space lawyer and professor of space and society. 
at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society at Arizona State University. She brings a very unique international perspective to the future of space exploration, and she joins us remote from Canada. Also with us is Jessie Kate Shingler. She's an expert in space governance and institution design, and she leads policy and governance at Open Lunar Foundation. She'll talk to us about unique governance approaches and resource management. We're also thrilled to have Mary Gunther with us today. She's a Hill veteran and director of space policy at the Commercial Space Flight Federation. And she'll share with us unique commercial perspectives and talk about the importance of norms and the art of achieving regulatory balance. Also on our panel is Brian Stanford, a senior counsel in the Contracts and Acquisition Group at NASA. Brian will share with us NASA ground truth in leveraging innovative procurement mechanisms to expedite technology development for lunar exploration. So for the format of this panel, we're gonna have each of our um, speakers share some really key insights, and then we're gonna move right into a Q&A discussion. And the questions will arise from a combination of myself, from Angela and from all of you through Slido. So please send us your questions through Slido and Angela will help to feed them forward. Okay, so I'm gonna zip it up now. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris Johnson. Chris, fly us to the moon. You gotta be corny, you just have to. <laughs> all right, let me bring my slides up. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, my slides are coming up. Um, yeah. Okay. Oh, perfect. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you for your attention. Um, you know, First, I want to say off right off the bat why this stuff matters. While it is true that in the international legal system, the international political order of 193 member states, those member states are the primary, primary uh, subjects of international law, including space law. But because of Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, everything that when I talk about space law and the Outer Space Treaty, all of those rights and obligations are also regulating private activities in a way that which is unique in international law. And this is why international law and space law matters so much even for private actors and non-governmental actors, as we'll get through. So uh, as a you know overview of this presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the general, general provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, we're gonna go through some of the articles. I put the articles up there for you to read. You know, I'll, I'll maybe give you 15, 20 seconds uh, per, article as we read it. I'll highlight some of the key provisions of it. Uh, and then we're gonna go a little bit into what's in the Artemis Accords, a little bit into national law. The headline though is right at, right at that bottom. F further specificity will be required. So when we talk about international space law and the Outer Space Treaty, it's a treaty on general provisions, general principles. But when we get down into the details of what you wanna do on the moon, uh, we're gonna need some iteration, some clarification on that, which is why we're here and why there's a lot of activity and work for space lawyers. So um, when we talk about international space law, we start at the UN level. Here is that booklet, uh, you know, international space law. You can download this, that link is on there. And also all of my slides um, are already shared. They are, you can go on your computers right now, uh, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash L-S-I-C, uh, May 4, and I think I have the, yeah, right there at the bottom is the, uh, the link to it. So you can read that and you can follow along with these slides and follow the links which exist there. All right, so the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, as of 2022, there are 110, 111 member states which are party to the Outer Space Treaty. Uh, 23 additional states have signed it but not yet ratified it. So this is quite a, a, quite a large um, uh, set of states and list of states and includes all the historical space powers and emerging space powers. And in fact, one of the, way that you, one of the ways that you signal to the uh, international system and the rest of the space community, one of the ways that you signal that you take outer space seriously and you want to become a known and trusted space actor is the first act you do is you know, sign the Outer Space Treaty and start trying to join the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So there are a number of articles in the Outer Space Treaty all of them are important for space activities, but within the context 
of uh, this conference and uh, lunar activities, I'm going to highlight a general um, highlight some of the most important fundamental principles in some of them. Of course, as you'll see as we go through it, these freedoms of exploration and use, and then in the treaty, freedom, freedoms, and the, you know, the, the rationale why a state would enter into a treaty are balanced with obligations, including some negative obligations, i.e. prohibitions. You must not do that. So let's get into it. Article one, freedom of exploration and use. The exploration and use of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all countries, irrespective of their degree of economic or scientific development, development and shall be the province of all mankind. Um, a lot to say in there, but again, you say that this is that freedom of exploration and use. The state doesn't have to ask the UN to, if they, you know, for permission, you don't have to ask the Security Council for permission to go to outer space. This makes it clear that you have the right to go to outer space and explore it and use it. Um, states, uh, outer space shall be free for exploration and use, and there should be free access. And then uh, the third sentence talks about international, uh, international cooperation. Um, Article two, here's that principle of uh, non-appropriation. It is a short uh, 30 words. Let's spend some time to actually read it. Outer space, including the moon is, and other celestial bodies, is not subject to. So this isn't, uh, you know, if you look at the grammar of that sentence, it's not saying states shall not appropriate. Oh, it is kind of almost a definition. Outer space, no matter what you do, is not subject to national appropriation. What could, you know, what are some methods? Claim of, claim of sovereignty, means of use or occupation, or any other means. If any of those steps does not solidify or concretize or, you know, perfect your use of outer space or, or a national appropriation. Uh, Article 4 really has to do with non-weaponization. I won't spend too much time on it you know, it pro prohibits WMDs from being placed in outer space. Uh, although some of the second paragraph really is particular to the moon. The moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all states parties exclusively for peaceful purposes. Not just for peaceful purposes, exclusively for, for peaceful purposes. And that second sentence has a even stronger non-militarization of the moon. The establishment of military bases, installations and fortifications, the testing of any types of weapons and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden. Quite a strong non-militarization of the moon. Uh, later sentences give a little, uh, I'd say slight caveats to that. Article six, here's uh, one of the most important articles of the treaty. State parties of the treaty shall bear international responsibility for national activities in outer space whether such activities are carried on by governmental agencies or by non-governmental entities, and a further obligation, and for assuring that national activities are carried out in conformity with the provisions set forth in the treaty. So this is a, a obligation placed on states. States are internationally responsible, i.e. they are answerable to other states for all of their national activities, and a further obligation, ensuring that those national activities conform with the provisions of the Outer Space Treaty. Second sentence, the activities of non-governmental entities in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, shall require authorization and continuing supervision by the appropriate state party to the treaty. So as I said at the top of my presentation, everything which is imposed on states also applies uh, in principle, if logic permits it, to private actors. Article seven just gives the, uh, a, uh, an element of international responsibility, meaning international liability, if you cause damage. And I don't really put the, the text of Article 7 in my slides um, for the purposes of time. But Article 8 has to do with jurisdiction control. States have jurisdiction and control over their launch space act, uh, launch space objects. Uh, this is how, you know, whether what you do on the moon, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You're a citizen of a state. Your spacecraft is a, has citizenship of a state. Article 9, Quite longer sentences, uh, you know, talks about the principle of cooperation and mutual assistance and also that obligation of due regard. Longer sentence, but again, we see these principles that are enshrined in the treaty and they also apply to private actors. Um, 
the second sentence deals with harmful contamination and, and requires states to conduct exploration so as to avoid harmful contamination. Any further obligation shall adopt appropriate measures for that purpose. Article 12, I don't often teach, people don't often look at, but, I, but as you look at it, actually has to do with visitation rights on the moon. All stations, installations, equipment, and space vehicles on the moon shall be open to representatives of other states parties to the treaty on a basis of reciprocity. And such representatives shall give reasonable notice. So uh, here's an element, just like in Article 4, Paragraph 2, where the moon is explicitly called out and mentioned. that there's, There is nuance given, and uh, this has not been you know, important for the last couple decades. It will become more important in the future. Uh, you know, I'll briefly go to the Artemis Accords. As you have heard about, 18 states are parties of the Artem Artemis Accords. There's a link to download them, load them for yourself. Many elements of the Artemis Accords are quite important. You'll see the interoperability, uh, preserving outer space heritage, space resources, deconfliction of activities. These are things that are not necessarily clear in the Outer Space Treaty, but they're expanded on a little bit more in the Artemis Accords, and we're going to need these elements uh, to do things back on the moon. Um, I put the, you know, the link for what is interoperability. Uh, there's an obligation for interoperability for what you're doing on the moon if you're an Artemis Accords partner. Section 10 has to do with space resources, but it largely reiterates what is already in the Outer Space Treaty and makes it clear that we can, in fact, use space resources on the moon. Um, also, this idea that there's deconfliction of activities between Artemis partners. Uh, they commit to seek to refrain from intentional activities that may create harmful interference and further on deconfliction activities. Um, and briefly, because I know my time is limited, but I want to talk about there is national legislation uh, governing space resources in a number of countries, US, Luxembourg, UAE, and Japan. In the uh, space resources law that we have here in the US, doesn't give a whole lot of guidance, but it has some guidance, useful definitions of asteroid resources, space resources. Uh, and has obligations for the appropriate federal agencies to facilitate commercial exploitation. Um, so we have something, but then again, if you want to use space resources, what government agency are you asking for permission? Do we ask Department of Commerce? Do we ask FAA, FCC? Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's uncertain who actually you're going to be asking for permission if your commercial company wants to use space resources. That is yet to be decided, but at least we have this law taking one step forward with it. Again, gives a, a make it clear what space resource rights are. All right, so thank you so much for the uh, time to explain some of the basic ten tenets of uh, international space law. Again, uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion. And from here, I hand it over to uh, Timmy, who is joining us online. So Timmy, if you can uh, identify that we can hear your voice and we have your slides as well. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. Um, thanks for that overview, Chris. And as I was sitting here listening to you, I kind of realized that most of my slides aren't relevant. So can we skip right up to the references? So just skip right up to the references. Tell me when, yes. Okay, yeah, just it. keep going. Skip, skip, <laughs> skip, 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 skip. Skip, skip, Foxy, skip. No one cares. No one cares. UN. UN I mean, wh whatever, right? Conclusion? Yeah. Conclusion? Nope, nope. Skip no to the references skip. slide. Okay. The ref. Okay. Perfect. Great. So, what Chris just laid out was really interesting. International law is great. And it's something that everyone gets together and they talk about this really nice thing. But domestic law is really where you see what people actually value. And the problem with that is that we have this issue of fragmentation when everyone is basically doing their own thing. And, you know, as Chris was talking, I was thinking in my head from a legal standpoint then, what are some really interesting issues in fragmentation that, that are relevant to talk about? And I really thought about two areas of law, competition law or antitrust in the U.S. and administrative law. So when we're talking about administrative law, I'm in a conference in Canada right now, straight after this I'm about to speak. And, you know, in Canada right now, they are deliberating about the MOU 
for the Memorandum of Understanding between Canada and the U.S. for the Gateway. And it's really interesting because when you look at the provisions there, it focuses on information disclosure and, and basically the non-applicability of certain rules in Canada. So you need to understand administrative law to figure out how are governments implementing these new requirements and, and what, is, what is the requirement there. So that's really fascinating. And then on the other side, with respect to competition law, like or antitrust law in the US, now that we're having more and more commercial actors, what kind of behaviors are private actors doing that are either monopolistic or anti-competitive? And I think that's really important. For instance, when we look at the NASA Lunar Resources contract, right? One of those contracts was just for $1. Now, you know, is that encouraging monopolistic behavior? Because not everyone is able to afford to do a contract in space where they only get $1 or, t or, or whatever out of it. And those companies essentially will be seeing this as marketing. But for the rest of us who are just, you know, average Joe companies trying to work on space, that looks anti-competitive. And But the challenge here is that the doctrines that apply, for instance, the rule of reason doctrine, which is antitrust law, which says a trade practice violates the Sherman Act only if the practice is an unreasonable restraint of trade based on economic factors. And this is a shambles because nobody knows what exactly is an unreasonable restraint of trade. I would say maybe a contract for a dollar, you know, that's pretty hard. So these references that I've got here, I've got a paper coming out in the Albany Law Review in the next few weeks. And these are some of the main references that I highlight, which essentially talk about which essentially talk about what diverse perspectives mean. So we've got perspectives here from Africa about what they think of the Artemis Accords. We've got people contextualizing. We've got critical approaches. We've got people who are against the Artemis Accords. And that first article by Melissa Durkee is really interesting because it talks about the role of entrepreneurs in legal interpretation. So that's all really complex stuff, but I kind of figured in only five minutes to tell you that I think if you're not a legal person and you only have limited resources to go look at an area, I would look at antitrust law and administrative law. Thank you. Thank you, Timmy. All right, so we'll move to Jesse Kate Schingler. Okay, can you hear me all right? Great. So, okay, as Timmy, oh, I'm just going to start my timer so I don't go over time. As Timmy and others have been pointing out, uh, there are a number of contentious issues when it comes to sustained presence on the moon. And there are a lot of different interests at stake, national, international, commercial, government. Uh, there are very few precedents or rules of the road that already exist. Uh, people in this room are helping to set those precedents. Uh, and so I work with an organization called Open Lunar Foundation, and um, it exists basically to help address some of these questions. So we're the only organization in the world that's dedicated to the good governance and setting of positive precedents in the lunar domain. We approach this by identifying opportunities to take to, sorry, to create public services and infrastructure that have certain qualities. They provide value to all lunar actors and other stakeholders for some definition of all, which is worth discussing. The idea of public goods emphasizes areas of coordination that could make lunar access and operations easier or more effective for everyone. This can be things like in-situ infrastructure uh, through to standards or services all things we're talking about today. We can think of an analogy to public goods 
uh, being provided by governments on Earth. But of course, as has already been pointed out, we don't have governments on the surface of the moon. So we have to create new institutions and develop participation architectures from scratch. And we think this is actually a great excuse to confront questions of shared values, trade-offs, and shared investment, and encourage cooperation and standards. Finally, at the same time, if we can figure out this kind of commons governance, which is effectively what it is, if we can figure this out for celestial bodies, then we also have an opportunity to apply our insights from these experiments to governance questions here on Earth as well. So Open Lunar in 2022, we have three main work areas. Uh, one is policy. We produce a comprehensive platform uh, for lunar policy that looks at areas of potential conflict as well as opportunities for cooperation. And we focus on two main sort of substantive areas. One is uh, lunar resources and the other is communications. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about both of those. So resource management and property rights. Oh, I gotta change the screen too. Um, so nation states typically create and enforce property regimes. But as Chris was pointing out to us, the Outer, Outer Space Treaty says that there shall be no national appropriation. So this means that the traditional bases for property regimes don't exist for us on the surface of the moon. So what will be the basis for our lunar property rights? We don't know yet. New institutions and coordination mechanisms are needed. And there are countless different approaches that we can refer to here on Earth for different approaches to stewardship uh, and resource management. And so one of the things that we try to emphasize in the work that we do is that when we talk about property rights, property rights are not always equivalent to private property rights. There are many different ways of putting in place um, institutional management and good governance of resources. And it's, this is the time for us that we can start to look at that and perhaps try out different approaches so that we can set positive precedents. Another big area of our work is lunar communications services and standards. So uh, there's some really exciting work happening between um, ESA and NASA, LunarNet, Moonlight. Uh, China just announced they're gonna be doing communications uh, and lots and lots of private companies are interested in this as well. So in this area, there's opportunities for looking at internetworking or uh, basically like backhaul links, uh, open standards, obviously positioning and timing are gonna be critical to all actors operating at the moon. Uh, situational awareness and registration uh, is important for understanding uh, what others are doing, uh, which we all care about. And all of these are areas where there's a, a shared service would be valuable to all actors, government, commercial, national, international. So the point is that while there's a lot of technology to develop in these areas, we also have a lot of muscle to build around cooperation as well. And that requires researching and prototypes. So we look for ways that operational technology can provide opportunities to do this, and we research it, uh, discuss with different stakeholders, uh, different approaches that might be of interest, and we design opportunities to intentionally lay the groundwork uh, for the way we want the future to be. So I'm just gonna talk about one uh, case study real quick, uh, and this is something called the Breaking Ground Trust. So Breaking Ground is a legally incorporated trust that the Open Lunar Foundation set up uh, to hold legal title to resources and objects on the moon. As I mentioned, we don't fully know what it means yet to hold title to natural resources on the moon. So there's lots of open questions. So there's an emerging consensus that you can do it, that we can do it, but how do you assert it? Who will listen? How do you construct accountability? And what are your responsibilities and to whom? So the goal is to prototype replicable, legally accountable mechanisms through the use of the trust structure in contract law. So it's a bit of an experiment. And the trust is working with commercial operators to do basically what, what NASA did and uh, I think what Timmy just mentioned, which is to purchase lunar regolith in place on the lunar surface. And then we use that to conduct multi-stakeholder dialogues to explore what commitments the trust should make in managing that regolith. 
So this is just a quick overview of the legal structure that we have set up. Trust at the top, there's an operating LLC. Uh, it manages lunar resources, held in trust, and advocates for resource rights and management approaches. It then uh, executes MOUs and purchase agreements and works with a community of stakeholders, uh, contributors, policymakers, et cetera, around it. So this is, um, in, uh, in fall 2021, we held one of these multi-stakeholder processes. A couple of folks in this room uh, were involved with that. And the mandate of this process was to develop different approaches to uh, rights frameworks for resources purchased through the trust. The goal was to gather people from different backgrounds and cultures, uh, nationalities and, and fields to discuss resource management regimes for the moon. And then to develop recommendations for the trustees uh, to implement when managing these lunar resources. The output, this took place over about five months um, and we put out a report with about 15 different recommendations. Uh, it was a group of about 12 people and the, the recommendations are available on our website at breakingground.space slash recommendations. So I just wanted to pause and say, why would a trust be fit to manage lunar resources? It says, again, you know, this is an experiment, and why are we doing this experiment, and why are we doing it in this way? So the first is that because it's a trust, it's a legally enforceable mechanism uh, with accountability built in. The second is that it's, this is independent of waiting for there to be international agreements about how to manage these resources. And those will come, at, but this can be, this can provide examples of how we can approach this so that policymakers and international uh, lawmakers can refer to examples and see what's working and maybe what isn't working. It's also an opportunity to prototype new approaches to resource management that we can use on Earth. And as you can tell, it's one of the themes in the work that we do. And finally, it's, um, you know, it's offering us a new type of institution, emphasizing stakeholdership and, and consultative process with subject matter experts. Uh, there's a few other areas uh, that I'll just go over real quick because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, but we sort of we think in general these exist in a category of what we call policy demos. So just like in the technology world, we need to go from TRL level, uh, you know, one to five or uh, five to one. I'm not sure what the order is, <laughs> but we need to do the same thing with with policies. We need to go from uh, you know developing them, testing them out, iterating. Uh, we often think about developing international treaties or national laws, uh, but if we get it wrong, it's hard to undo it. And so we're looking at ways that we can kind of uh, uh, prototype from the bottom up and, and create demonstrations that allow us to learn. So just to conclude, why do this? Uh, this, is, this is the moment to be intentional with what we're doing with the moon. As everybody's saying, we're going back, it's really exciting. Uh, there's going to be a lot happening. There's a ton more actors now going to the moon than there's ever been before. Uh, all of these missions that are the private missions, the CLIPS missions that are going, uh, not only do they have, are, are they operated by commercial companies, uh, often they've got international uh, range of operators of payloads, uh, the, the coordination that's necessary between those payloads, between the individuals on the, uh, operating those payloads, uh, that's just things that we've never seen before. So now's the time to be intentional, shape the future we want, um, and also an opportunity to um, set norms, uh, again, from the bottom up, so that they don't just get imposed uh, from the top down, but by doing it as a community, we get to kind of shape and respond to the, um, the, real, the realities of uh, operational considerations. Um, so I think that is all. Um, thanks very much. There's some links, and feel free to check them out. Next, we have Mary Gunther. Mary, yeah. Thank you so much. I'm pleased to be here today and looking forward to talking through law and technology policy for the moon. Um, so I wanted to start, you know, as Aparna mentioned, I am 
coming off of a couple of years on Capitol Hill. And one of the things we always do when we're thinking about a policy making exercise is what is the goal? You know, what is the intention? What are we looking to get to? And so I was sitting down before this panel trying to think through, you know, what would a goal, um, ideally one that would be a consensus goal, one that everyone could kind of get behind be? And this is what I came up with. Um, you know, folks want to be able to reliably utilize the lunar environment for novel activities, both today and for the long term. And I'd be curious, please don't hesitate to come af after me um, after this panel and let me know if any of you disagree with that. Because um, thinking through what some of the different stakeholders in this environment want, whether they're governments, researchers, commercial entities, other stakeholders, um, this seemed like a, a good place to start in terms of how we should be thinking about and approaching this. The next question, of course, is how do we get there? Because that's pretty high level. Um, and so the point of this talk will be to focus on how we get there using norms and hard law, both domestically and internationally. Because right now there is little guidance, as has been noted, on what it looks like to be a responsible actor in the lunar environment. You know, obviously there are some common guidelines. Obviously you don't want to crash into someone else's spacecraft. People tend to not like that. Um, but figuring out at a high level what that responsible behavior looks like and clearly communicating it um, on the international stage is going to be really critical, especially as the uh, lunar environment is rapidly democratizing and new actors are entering this sector. It's incredible to see what's planned uh, for the lunar surface. I know Jim Ryder was going through some of the topical areas earlier today during his talk, uh, and some of my colleagues on this panel have mentioned them as well. But it's going to be everything from in situ research utilization to crude operations on the surface and beyond. And so it's going to be critical to find that balance both domestically and internationally between norms and hard law. So I'm going to focus domestically because that's where my experience lies. Um, but to set the stage, and Chris thankfully went through a number of the relevant articles of the Outer Space Treaty, but the ones that I'm going to be focusing on here, the ones that are most applicable in my mind to the domestic framework as it currently stands, are looking through the requirements for mission authorization and ongoing supervision of activities authorized by each nation. Um, and of course, the liability convention of the 1970s comes into play as well. So that's a lot of the kind of framework that has led to our domestic framework, which is responsive to treaty obligations. You see that in launch licensing, you see that in remote sensing licensing, right? Those licensing processes are to make sure that the nation state, um, in this case, focusing on the United States, is aware of what these actors are doing. There are certain obligations as a, you know, a criteria for getting that license, and the government is ensuring via relevant agencies that that happens and that folks are acting responsibly. This regime has worked well heretofore, um, but with all the novel activities that are being developed by the commercial sector, companies are struggling to figure out what the mission authorization regime is going to look like for novel activities. You'll see that question mark on the slides. Um, it's incredibly challenging for folks to figure out how to get something done the first time, right? I mean, I think the launch licensing and the remote sensing licensing regimes make great sense for something that has been done, you know, at least 100 times, I think, on both counts. Um, but that first time looking at, at the, you know, 11 to 18 agencies that you have to talk to who regulate space activities, you know, which ones do you have to talk to? Um, what kind of permissions do you need to get? Who do you need to speak to within those agencies? Um, it's quite challenging. And I think we are starting to come up to a point where conversations about what those regimes should look like for novel activities are coming to a head, and I'm excited to be part of those conversations. So my organization kind of heretofore has argued for some kind of a mission authorization construct that is generally permissive while protecting for, of course, public safety and treaty obligations. Um, that's conventionally been thought of as something that would be administered by the Department of Commerce. Um, and the thinking here is that there's not necessarily a need to create a dedicated regulatory framework that is specific to each of these activities, right? Especially when um, a lot of times these are can be higher risk activities um, or demo missions. And so you would hate to spend the time, the resources, um, the government funds required to create a dedicated regulatory framework for a specific activity only to find that, you know, maybe we're not quite at that phase or maybe the regulatory environment re regime that was 
proposed or that was put into place it didn't take into account all of these lessons learned from the first couple of missions. So I think it's, it's critical to make sure that we are establishing the regulatory certainty for commercial actors so that folks understand that you know there is a way forward, there's a process that you can follow. These are the people you need to talk to at these agencies to do this thing and there are, and so forth. Um, without creating an abundance of red type that makes it incredibly challenging to move forward with these exciting and novel activities. Now, beyond this, for more established activities, I think it's really critical to maintain the balance as well between regulatory certainty and overregulation. And that can be a bit of a gray area looking at it. Um, I'm the first to cop. It's hard to find that balance. Um, and that balance sometimes shifts from time to time as industries mature and we go from there. But one thing I will say is really critical to keep in mind is um, the threat of venue shopping. We've seen this in other industry sectors where other nations would love to eat our lunch, so to speak, um, and attract the space industry to their nations. Um, and why wouldn't they? It's a great industry, as represented by the folks in this room. There are a lot of economic and soft power benefits. Um, and so we would never want to you know, gatekeep any country from standing up a space economy in their place. However, where the concerns come in is that occasionally to attract that industry, these other nations will create an incredibly permissive regulatory environment. Um, and that can be a problem because what we don't want is a regulatory race to the bottom, right? There are certain treaty obligations. There are reasons why it's important to have regulations and have those kind of barriers to activities um, to ensure that the lunar environment is maintained in a safe and sustainable manner today and for the long term. So that is kind of the established regulatory as well as the novel regulatory picture. So now let's talk about norms. Um, these are critical, uh, as Jesse Keat was mentioning, in the, as particularly in the absence of having an international agreement that is kind of caught up to where we are today. Um, trying to establish some kind of an agreement, norms typically taking that example that sets into an easily understandable and accessible format. You know, this is what responsible behavior looks like. This is what standard behavior looks like. Um, and we're already starting to see these fora where there are policy experiments that are gonna be informing these norms, where folks, including government, industry, academia, and other stakeholders are coming together to start to have these conversations about you know, what each of those stakeholders needs on the lunar environment, what needs to be protected for, um, and how do we make sure that we are aligning the incentives of all of those actors in a way that makes sense uh, for establishing what those norms on the lunar surface are gonna be. So we've been really thrilled to see those conversations take off, and we hope to see much more of that in the years to come as we get closer and closer to the next human landing on the moon, as well as many missions more to come. So I'm just going to end by revisiting that goal. Um, again, I think it's critical to think about this in a collaborative manner and think about this in bringing together government, industry, and academia, as opposed to, you know, favoring one over the other or anything along those lines. And so with that, I am really grateful for the opportunity to be here, and I'm thrilled to hand this off to Brian from NASA, who is going to be speaking to some of the incredible contracting mechanisms that help foment that competition and that success. Good afternoon, y'all. Uh, I don't think I'm in control of my slides, so I guess I'll just call next. Uh, thank you to APL for uh, allowing me to, to be here today uh, and to um, bookend, oh, perfect. I can control them, awesome, this is great. Uh, I have some control. Um, and to bookend, uh, oh, perfect, okay, great. 
Um, I'll make, make my remarks quick. Um, I get to be on this panel with, with all of these luminaries, space law luminaries, and, and I'm just a, a lowly government contracts lawyer, but I, I do have the best, uh, best job in the world. Uh, so, so I'll run through some of our acquisition strategies and, and contractual mechanisms uh, to actually enable some of these partnerships. Um, and, and it's always important to start, I think, with um, uh, you know, wh what the agency, what NASA um, can do. Uh, and by the way, as I go through this, these are, these are I, I work for NASA, my client, uh, Space Tech Mission Director, is in the room. These views are my own. Uh, so I do want to caveat, um, caveat that. But to, to run through our, our organic authority, uh, as well as a national space policy, right? It's really important, I think, to, to accentuate that it's our job as an agency to, to seek and encourage the, to the maximum extent possible the full commercial use of space. Uh, I think that possible is really important. Uh, and so what we're doing here is, 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 is hemming very close to our, our, our space policy, policy by uh, enabling these commercial uh, partnerships, accelerating tech development, uh, and, and, and then creating uh, uh, both global and domestic markets. Uh, and, and these initiatives, again, also hem very close to our, our strategic goals, particularly uh, tech development uh, and, and engagement uh, on, on innovative partnership uh, strategies and structures. Uh, so how are we doing this uh, in the lunar sphere? Uh, a good place to start is, is what we've done already in LEO um, and, and a, a, good, a good kind of um, uh, keystone example of that, right, is, is our, our COTS program going through to our uh, commercial cargo and crew services program. Um, you know, that's a, that's a success story. Obviously, LEO is not a, you know, it's not uh, as, a, as a marketplace, right? I think it's grown a lot in the past 15 years. Uh, but but there's still a, lo a long way to go, uh, and we're doing it today with our, our commercial Leo destinations efforts. Um, and so so uh, to unpack this a little bit, you know, again, we we as as an agency want to be one of of many customers uh, in the long term sustainable uh, lunar economy. Um, you know, the objective is to get there, right? We're going to be leveraging commercial flexibilities and capabilities. We're going to be stimulating demand. If we if we go there first, uh, hopefully the market will follow. Um, we're obviously uh, uh, putting out funding and, and partnership opportunities to foster the domestic industrial base that can compete for these types of opportunities, trying to lower cost barriers uh, uh, through, through the provision of funding and other support, uh, and, and managing risk. And it's interesting to think about risk, um, you know, from, uh, from the, 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 you know, the LEO commercial, or the lunar commercial perspective versus the contractual uh, perspective in, in a contract one or both parties bear uh, a certain amount of risk depending on the contract type, contract terms. Uh, interestingly here, right, risk is kind of shared because we have a common, I mean, NASA has a goal of, of mission execution. They have goals of, of uh, a stimula mission, uh, uh, commercial stimulation uh, and, and uh, the, the commercial sector obviously has their own uh, goals and, and their own risk and we kind of share them in a weird way uh, in these instruments. So how do we do it? innovative acquisition strategies. Uh, and so that's where I get to, to come in and, and hopefully help. Um, so I, I point to, to our policy, right? Our, we define acquisition as obtaining, but also advancing the development of, of capabilities. Um, and so uh, it's, it's on us to, to really lean forward on some of these strategies uh, to effectuate these, these partnerships and actually make the whole enterprise successful. Um, so, so what does that look like? Um, again, it is, it is really all about kind of how and when we uh, provide government investment uh, to spur critical technology development uh, for, for technologies that are, um, we know are directly applicable to NASA, we think may be directly applicable to NASA, maybe ancillary to, to NASA, um, but, but still in the, the lunar ecosystem. Uh, obviously funding, government funding is an issue. Um, we are, uh, you know, deviating, I think, from, you know, your traditional cost type contracts. Uh, we're, ex we're expecting commercial uh, investment in these uh, uh, activities and these efforts. Um, we've been doing a lot more for, uh, fixed price contracting, uh, performance-based milestone payment mechanisms, uh, where we're actually seeing um, results, you know, before the government provides funding. Uh, we want to be streamlining our acquisition processes, right? We don't want to be stuck in a procurement for 18 months. Um, we are really leaning on industry-led development. Uh, we're combining the best of both NASA and commercial, uh, and because NASA has a lot to offer in this in this space as well. Uh, so how we fine-tune that relationship is really important, and how we 
memorialize that relationship is very important. Uh, you know, depending on the instruments that we're using, right? We're minimizing requirements. We're talking about objectives, we're talking about performance requirements. We're using, we're leveraging now our, our OTA mechanisms, right? Uh, to spur commercial development where we may not have requirements at all. Um, we're not, you know, taking ownership of hardware. I mean, there's a lot of recent examples of that, right? We're funding development, we're funding demonstration. Uh, we're asking industry, what is your commercialization plan? It can't just be, I'm gonna sell to NASA, you know, here two, four. Uh, and again, we're, we're leaning on uh, innovations within the FAR when we're on the procurement side of the house versus the OTA side of the house. Um, and we're, it's all about kind of how you sequence uh, those instruments, when you do it, at what phase. Um, and so you're, you're, you're establishing kind of a flow state uh, through these different uh, instruments uh, um, and, and when you actually award them and, and how you uh, time uh, performance. So, uh, so just a, a, a quick run through of, of some of our efforts. This is by no means an exhaustive list. Uh, and I'm leading with, with space tech, obviously, right? But we have a lot of, of innovative mechanisms and opportunities that, that the mission directorate has been, has been uh, leveraging. Uh, one, a, a big one that comes to mind is SBIR. Um, you know, and, and the, the, the whole point of SBIR, right, is, is early stage funding uh, for development of innovative technologies uh, and de-risking, uh, you know, technology, creating those, those business cases uh, for, for development, both with governmental and, and non-governmental customers. Uh, and within that program, there are all kinds of flexibilities uh, from, a, from a procurement and contracting standpoint uh, that, that the agency and the commercial industry can avail themselves of. Um, tipping point is a, is a big one, uh, as well as ACO that's ongoing right now. Uh, again, uh, uh, getting NASA funding, NASA collaborative support uh, to advance uh, uh, technologies that are um, at a TR level where they're at a tipping point, uh, and uh, they need that, the push of that effort uh, to kind of get them over that, that hurdle. Uh, and again, there's, there's many more opportunities uh, in the research and development area um, you know, for, for the commercial sector, for academia. Um, obviously, ESD, MD uh, has a lot of recent uh, contractual vehicles in this area, right? We have HLS, uh, really kind of a, a, a sea change from the way that we are contracting for spaceflight hardware. Uh, GLS, same thing, uh, Gateway Logistics Services, it's a service contract uh, for resupply of, of Gateway. Uh, the power propulsion element uh, was procured uh, using FAR Part 35 uh, broad agency announcement mechanism as a demonstration and development activity. Uh, and then we've, we've obviously heard, heard of CLIPS uh, as a services model um, where, where uh, NASA is not developing uh, a capability but relying on the commercial sector to provide services uh, for delivery of payloads to the surface. So how does this actually get done? Uh, that we have a, a, a variety of contractual and agreement mechanisms uh, that we are employing, that we're, we're coming up with, um, you know, in, in close collaboration with industry, to be honest. Uh, we're getting really uh, forward-leaning when we need to deviate uh, from the FAR and the NASA FAR supplement, uh, when we have the authority to do so, and where it's advantageous both for the agency and for our partners. Uh, we've worked a lot on different uh, approaches to contractor insight, where NASA is, uh, you know, uh, taking uh, its foot off the pedal of, of government oversight of an effort, uh, and uh, but still being able to effectuate uh, meaningful con uh, insight over contractor, you know, uh, industry-led activities, uh, and and how that actually gets done is is through contractual mechanisms, um, and uh, obviously we we are availing um, industry of NASA resources, expertise, facilities. We need to memorialize that agreement, uh, and so that's that's where we come in. Uh, indemnification is, is a huge topic, uh, one that, one that uh, comes up a, a lot uh, in debates within the agency on the Hill. Um, you know, we, we don't have 85804 authority because of the very nature of our activities, uh, but, but we do have other statutory authority for indemnification. And, and regardless, uh, we, we really try to be forward leaning uh, to, to uh, extrapolate uh, and, and um, uh, build off of our, our ISS cross waiver of liability for damages um, and, and really get uh, terms for liability and insurance requirements uh, that we feel both protect NASA's property and interests, but also um, uh, you know, incentivize uh, the, the commercial sector to actually um, uh, conduct these activities uh, as protected space operations. So um, you know, our, our, uh, our recent um, uh, 
intergovernmental agree agreement uh, with respect to gateway uh, really builds on our ISS cross waiver. Um, we have specialized termination and mission uh, success termination provisions, also milestone payment provisions I talked about earlier. Um, we can tailor those for, for instruments depending on what's advantageous for the matter at hand and the parties uh, at play. And then IP data rights are obviously huge. Uh, you know, we, we have, uh, we, the, the agency uh, has been very forward leaning and waiving title to inventions in advance of, of instrument execution in recent years uh, to protect industry IP. SBIR has its own uh, regime of, of data rights uh, and IP protections. Actually, that's a, that's a current FAR case right now uh, where the, the FAR is actually uh, catching up with, with SBA's policy directive with respect to the protection period for SBIR uh, data produced under SBIR contracts. Uh, our HLS data rights clause is novel and, and borrows heavily from uh, concepts that are, that are um, enshrined in the DFARS, uh, but that really try to um, uh, marry up uh, the government's interests and, and private, uh, the private sector's investment in the activity uh, so that NASA receive gov receives government purpose rights uh, in a lot of the data that is uh, created under that contract. Uh, tipping point. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done Ryan. a lot of work on um, making sure that our partners Testing. are, um, uh, you know, is it time? Yeah. So that, again, the fine print. Thank you, Timmy, for going through your slides earlier, by the way. I felt like I was reading like a terms of service uh, from my, my phone. Um, so uh, j just to follow up here, th these are not traditional government contracts, uh, and we're thankful for that, but they're also, um, they pr prevent, uh, present a lot of challenges. I do think, you know, again, we're trying to build a legal, uh, economic ecosystem here. Uh, there, there is variation amongst instruments, but we also realize that consistency and interoperability in terms of conditions is really important. It's something we uh, debate about a lot. Uh, and we've been really forward leaning in trying to get out of the box from our traditional uh, government procurement and other instruments. Um, again, it's really important, I think, uh, top of mind for us to engage early and often with industry on these. Uh, you know, to achieve that kind of buy-in. Industry days, draft solicitations, Q&As uh, have really paid dividends for us as we've uh, definitized some of these uh, special terms and conditions. So um, that's all I have. All right, guys, that was so fun. We just uh, ran out of time, but here's the thing, here's the deal. We are capturing all of your questions. I got to have this final slide here. We're capturing all of your questions uh, through Slido. And what we're going to have is we're going to have our panelists respond to your questions, OK? So we are ingesting everything. We're going to respond to your questions offline. We're also going to respond to your questions by a confluence as well. So we are hearing you. Please keep those thoughts coming. Another quick thing is tomorrow we're having a breakout session at 3.30 dedicated to space law and policy. So bring your questions to that, to that panel, and we'll have an intimate discussion. And some of our panelists will be there as well to respond um, and we can have a great time. So um, what else do I want to say? Uh, one quick thing. So uh, somewhere over there in that picture, there's a Moz Isley Cantina. I hear they serve a really mean dark side martini. And if alcohol isn't your thing, they've got blue milk. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And may the fourth be with you. Thank you.